Hello everyone, Kentu Tiger here with Bengali Engineering and Play. We are back in Space Engineers. We're kind of continuing on with our survival series too. Uh, I am, uh, or have been rather, experimenting with these guys. Which are the beam drills, the laser beam drills. And uh, this set happens to have turrets on it. Uh, I started out with uh, with just the beam drills, and they were um, very impressive, but um, they did some strange things. So uh, the strange things was that um, they don't just turn on and go. Uh, so I have not played with these in a very long time. Um, I want to say... It's been about two years. Um, and the reason I say that is I played with them right when they were first put up on the, uh, uh, on the workshop and uh, had a lot of fun with them. Uh, the biggest uh, problem was power. Um, these, these guys uh, take a, a boatload of power uh, to run them. Um, and there's still a bug... Um, so normally when something takes too much power, uh, your grid goes to zero and you just fight with it. Um, in the case of these guys, for some reason, when they turn on and you do not have enough power on the grid, <laughs> your game will crash. So I don't know that it's entirely this block, but it, it probably has something related to this block. So I've seen several... Uh, several other uh, space engineers youtubers that that actually do have this same problem and kind of have demonstrated this that that oops uh, so whenever you're doing builds with this um, when you first launch your build and, and your finger is poised on that on button uh, go ahead and do a quick save uh, believe me it will it will uh, uh, help you out quite a bit save you a lot of frustration because uh, you know if, if you're like me then you build something and you immediately go to the, into that test mode, you press the on button and then everything explodes and you realize after, of course, it explodes that, uh, that you haven't saved for two and a half hours. So, oops. So anyway, uh, save yourself the heartache. Uh, press that uh, shift F5. That's a quick save. Save you a lot of heartache. Um, so um, this was a mock-up proof of concept. Uh, in the end, because this was designed to travel, which is to say this was designed for you would just kind of strafe over the top of that, uh, uh, that asteroid, um, I did the offset thing, and, and I thought that would work out really well. Um, and, and in fact, it did. Um, the, the thing about the beam drills that I was not expecting was they live the, the, they leave these little chunks. Um, so when they're not a steered beam, uh, they, they leave these little chunks. And, uh, as you move, unless you get that little chunk to the center of the beam where it actually says, oh, there's something here, then it, it won't actually turn back on and, and take that little chunk out. So... Uh, I went ahead and decided, okay, let me just put the turrets on here. And uh, so that's what I ended up doing. And uh, I did some testing yesterday, and uh, one of the things I discovered, um, one of my complaints is memory management with space engineers, or rather the lack thereof. And one of the things I'm discovering, so currently right now, which is uh, about normal for the game, um, especially as you start getting a lot of independent grids. So in this case, um, I have about six independent grids um, in, in the game right now. So if we consider we have the planetary base, so that's a grid. Uh, I have a, uh, a the, the mini miner down there, uh, my favorite miner, uh, is down there. Uh, so there's two grids. Um, there's the space station here, which actually is, is a very large grid, um, 147 by something if we do block counts. Um, so it is a very large grid. It's, it's under the threshold to the point where it's not just totally laggy all the time like the original space station was. 
uh, but it, it's still definitely uh, causing the CPUs to work a little bit. Um, so that's grid number three. Uh, there's this grid here, which is grid number four. Uh, I deleted one of the other grids, so I guess I'm wrong. We actually only have five grids. Uh, and then there's another grid that is sitting... Uh, I lost my space station. Uh, where is my space station? Uh, there it is. Um, there's actually another grid over here that is a rebuild of this guy that, that you see sitting in front of us. And I'll, I'll get to that. That's actually kind of what this particular video is about, is kind of the, the tour of these, these guys and, and the proof of concept, uh, which is what this guy is. So uh, this offset idea, uh, great and fine and dandy, but uh, really didn't work quite as anticipated. So it leaves a lot of, of uh, those little bits uh, left. Um, the, the only... Uh, criticism, uh, if I can uh, call it that, is the beam drills versus the turretized beam drills. Uh, there's a huge differential. Um, the, the beam drill, it, 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 it's fixed, okay? It, it, it doesn't move um, with, within. It does, it does slightly move, uh, at least from what I was watching. It, it does kind of steer the beam you know, like a degree or two, so it's not anything amazing. Um, but, um, so, uh, for example, um, this, this asteroid here, which has everything in it, um, uh, obviously this is a remake. Um, as, as you notice, this is, uh, this is whole again. Um, so, uh, this guy is 250 meters across. So it, it's pretty substantial. It, um, what are there, nine, nine different, uh, nine different uh, ores. Uh, so 10 including ice and 11 if we include, um, yeah, which works out about right. So it's, it's like 10 meters each. Um, For, for each layer and then the platinum in the middle is is like 30 meters or 50 meters or something like that across um, so in the end you get uh, you know 20 meters of everything uh, going across and of course radius being radius you know volume um, is is pretty substantial so if you do the volume is of a sphere uh, and I won't I won't uh, totally insult you by rattling off the the uh, the equation there. If you want the equation, I'll I'll let you work through that. I know I know some people just absolutely hate math, and and the 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 single largest dream, uh, whether college or high school, was to never ever 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 take another math class. So I won't I won't do that to you. So uh, let's let's get into this. So uh, what I was saying here was the beam drills actually bored all the way through this entire asteroid all 250 meters across uh, I want to say it was about 45 seconds it, it just totally nuked all the way through pulled all the material up it was it was actually really impressive um, when I put the turrets on it, um, it it's kind of hard to say how it's doing but it doesn't appear to be even half as fast uh, now it is directional. It's entirely automatic. I literally set this thing to go and just let it do what it did um, over the course of four or five hours, and uh, it it cleared an awful lot of of the uh, uh, of the asteroid away. I guess where the differential, which is of course entirely subjective, was that okay, I have these 15 beam drills, and they bored their independent holes through this thing in 45 seconds so my thoughts were okay if I have them with the turrets on then we should be able to conceivably um, given the the volume that these beam drills can go you know singularly that that they would actually uh, bore through this entire you know basically collect this entire asteroid in you know three or four hours uh, and that that was not the case uh, it did put a big dent in it 
but uh, it did not uh, clear it as I as I thought it would. Um, so I, I did see uh, a substantial differential there. And, and of course, I, I haven't sat down and, and done my proverbial test plan and really figured out, okay, what is this going to take uh, a, a legitimate test of beam drill versus turretized beam drill. Um, so I haven't done that, and, and I, I might not, because uh, that really wasn't the goal. Uh, but, you know, then again, it, it might be something worth doing. So, um, the, the other thing that I touched on very briefly was, was uh, my another space engineer's rant, which was the memory thing. Um, I have uh, long been professing the memory issues. So, this is straight load in, which is pretty normal, is uh, just a hair over 12 gig. So, right now running 12.288 uh, gig. Um, and it, it's pretty stable there. It goes up to 288, then it drops down to, uh, you know, 276, 275, uh, then it, it, it bounces in there. So, that's pretty much, I think, the idle when I first load in this world. So, uh, while I think that. Uh, 12 gig uh, is a stupidly and absurd amount of memory. Um, you know, clearly there are some memory management issues there. Uh, the the game engine could use some some I incredible uh, memory efficiency uh, optimizations there. But um, so what I was noticing, so the game will get up to about 58 or 59 gig and crash uh, it, it I've never seen it hit 60 um, now of course here again my rant is um, even number crunching should not need that magnitude of RAM okay y the the use of that much RAM is absolutely and absurdly ridiculous so having said that what I've noticed is when you get into mining, um, whether it be with the regular drills, I, d I did this with the large scale drill, the 304 drill uh, machine that we were using, uh, or this one, uh, it didn't matter. After a while, as you are mining, I, I've watched that memory creep up and creep up, and it, and it creeps up in the tune of uh, 10 to 12 megabytes per second it, it's increasing and I wish I had a piece of software that would actually plot this and and I could put it on the screen uh, while I was while I was mining but I, I don't have anything that can do that um, I, I really wish I did um, so um, I, I finally reach uh, the limit of the game uh, and it will crash um, or I can look at it and I mean there there are telltale signs when I get to that point because you know eventually Windows um, while Windows can be really stupid with with memory management one of the things it starts doing when it has used up all the system RAM is, is to start swapping to the swap space on the hard drive and even though this particular machine has a solid state drive that's reasonably fast, um, a hard drive, solid state drive, doesn't matter. It's not a, a hundredth as fast as RAM is. I mean, RAM reads and writes in nanoseconds. Um, and, and uh, you know, hard drives, SSDs write in milliseconds. So uh, there's a huge difference there. So when it starts needing to read and write into memory space uh, and Windows is now using um, the swap space to do that, then you see these, these uh, lag spikes, I'll call them, which is really just the game pausing while it either reads or writes that memory, or I presume that's what it's doing, and your, your game freezes. And then it will run for about half a second and then freeze. Then run for half a second, freeze. Run for half a second. So once you get up to that point, there are the telltale signs that, okay, something is amiss here. And uh, this is going to crash soon. 
So I bring up and, and glance over at, I use Windows Task Manager because it's e easy, and I can see what memory it's using, and I see, oh, yeah, yeah, we're up here at 57, 56 gigabytes uh, of RAM. And, uh, you know, as I'm mining, I watch it, and it's, it's going up uh, anywhere from 8 to 12 megabytes per second. Uh, and, and just that steady increase as you're mining. Now, why it needs to do that, I have no idea. I, I would accuse that this, uh, you know, I, I can see, okay, it's reading, it's determining, okay, this is what the voxels are, this is what the yield of those voxels are, but why does it need to store that information? There's no need to store it. Once it's, you know, into the containers, then it should be into the data space that's been already created for that container when you put it down. So I, I have no idea what it's doing there. Uh, and the fact that they're not doing updates for space engineers anymore tells me that memory leak is never, ever going to get solved. That you just, here it is, deal with it, uh, which, is, which is disappointing. But anyway, uh, as this was not intended to be a rant, of course they never are, right? So uh, this was a mock-up of beam drills. And uh, so we have 15 of them stacked here, five, five, and five, and they're offset by one block. Originally, I thought they were five by five, but they're actually a three by three by one block. Um, so that was like, oh, wow, okay, I'm wrong. Um, so offset by one block. Uh, so the idea was I could strafe across the top, the side, however you want to look at it. There's not really a top or side or up or down in space. Um, so that was my thought, was that I could just strafe across the top and slowly move forward and then eat the entire asteroid. And the reason I strayed away from that is uh, as these things go, they, they utterly clear uh, the asteroid uh, exactly as, as I thought they would, but uh, by the same token, okay, I've all right. Um, sorry for that. Um, I I just had a power up. Yep, power's out. And uh, I, I don't know if this will recover well or not. I'm hoping it will. It may or may not. Kind of, kind of looks like we did. Okay, sorry about that. What happened? Uh, I had a, a power out here, and uh, w rather than uh, continuing. So all, all of my equipment is on UPSs, uninterruptible power supplies. And, uh, apparently my game machine, I have not set up to continue running. So what happens is when it senses, um, so for those of you who are uh, into networking and having all your equipment, uh, interconnected together, um, the, the UPS is wired onto uh, in this case, it uses USB uh, to communicate with the computer. And what it does is it says, okay, I'm on battery power and you have X number of battery left. Now, the, the, I'm, I'm running the big machine on a 1500 uh, VA uh, unit. Uh, it has a auxiliary battery pack. So there's four batteries in it. They're, uh, they're either seven uh, amp hour um, or 12, maybe 11s. Uh, it, de it depends on the series that you buy. And, and I don't remember what I actually replaced these with because I, these, these are, are not brand new. They're, they're quite a few years old. Um, but I've replaced them and, and the, the battery pack actually has a set of eight batteries. Uh, wait a minute. Let me, let me check myself here. There's two batteries inside. Uh, that are that are back to back. Yeah, it's two batteries inside and four batteries in the in the external pack, and they're wired in as uh, 
24 volt yeah they're wired in series um, so the two batteries inside which are 12 volt uh, either 7 or 11 or 12 amp hour batteries I don't remember which ones I bought um, wired in series so 12 volt wired in series is 24 volts so the unit itself is 24 volts and then it uses the external one is wired in parallel and series so what it is is two batteries are wired in series and then another set also wired in series is right next to them in parallel so you basically have two 24 volt sets wired in parallel which gives you twice the amperage so in the end you end up with three sets of batteries wired in parallel to one another that are providing 24 volts across all three sets of batteries um, so it's basically extended runtime is is the idea here and uh, so it, it actually has a long time that it can run it's like uh, 45 minutes or something like that that it could run you know while I'm doing the, this kind of graphics um, but what it does is it communicates says I'm on battery power shut down and so the machine goes into standby sleep mode uh, and then uh, there it is so anyway what I need to do is actually set it so it does not go into sleep mode uh, it goes into uh, well it doesn't do anything I, I really don't want it to do anything I want it to run until the battery's dead and then stop uh, which is exactly what the recording machine did which is why it went no signal on you so uh, anyway sorry about that um, didn't intend to have that happen but of course I never intend to have power drop so um, what we have is 15 beam drills I offset them so I used batteries to fill up the space eventually took out two batteries and put uh, thrusters down here so let's go ahead and look down below uh, I ended up putting two thrusters so um, I, I didn't really calculate any of this out to determine oh I need four thrusters nope didn't do any of that uh, literally was the experimentation of uh, okay let me just uh, put uh, thrusters around here so I had six front and back as you can see on the side um, so this, uh, sorry, this, this over here is the front, uh, and this over here is the back. And then, uh, we had three on each side, so, uh, about half the thrust capability, uh, on the sides, port to starboard. And then I had four up and four down. So there was, there was no finesse here. This was not intended to be graceful or, or looking nice. This was entirely a proof of concept. So there was a lot of things that I did here that, that I would not normally do. Uh, all this stuff interconnected. Um, I did not put, uh, well, can't see it, but, um, oh, actually, it's back here. Um, so you, you can't see it, but what I did was actually this piece right here um, underneath. So this is a container. This is then the, um, so these are elsewhere containers, so they're, they're just absolutely, utterly huge. Um, as, as far as storage capability, like 9.2 trillion or something like that. Um, so this is the, the main receiver that comes off the drills, but it's all interconnected. So I didn't really differentiate here between uh, my oxygen supply, my hydrogen supply, or anything. You can see all the tanks out here. And these are, of course, modded tanks. Um, I, I'm not a modeler. I wish I was. Uh, otherwise, I would change these uh, from uh, saying oxygen to saying hydrogen, and I, I need to really sit down and, and learn and figure out how to do that seems like it would be a simple enough change uh, but I haven't figured out how to do that and I know there's a lot of good tutorials out there I just need to sit down and, and do some learning um, so uh, I, I kind of have I, it, it's not that I have an aversion to learning it's that I have I have done so much formal education in my life that I, I just I tend to not sit down and, and do a lot of just learning for learning's sake anymore um, I mean I do learn things every day uh, they say if you if you learn you know life is about learning something new every day and, and I truly believe that but usually it's that you know five minute I'm, I'm searching around on the internet oh there's something I didn't know uh, kind of a thing um, but to sit down and actually formally you know learn how to do a, a new skill uh, that's a little more involved so uh, what we have is our uh, our uh, cargo transmit container here and uh, even though it's off uh, this is the uh, the cargo teleporter here and I, I have there's there's actually a whole bunch of, uh, of material in here uh, so let me let me actually go in here uh, do, do hide empty 
So you can see all our, our reactors have pulled in everything. The gas generators are, are nearly full. Uh, and then we have the storage container, which is just absolutely ridiculously full. So here's the 76 million. Um, gravel is 48 million. Ice is 43 million. Uh, the only things that are that are kind of interesting to look at is the, like magnesium. Uh, not a whole lot of magnesium. Uh, and strangely enough, we had a, a boatload of gold, but not a whole lot of silver. So it, it was kind of one of those, uh, how does this actually do that? Um, so, uh, and of course we could look uh, the same way over here. Uh, I did actually put M Masters uh, automatic LCDs on here. Um, I, I, I just pasted on my standard, uh, you know, four tier or four LCD pre-configured for LCD displays so uh, but this is really the one that you need so if you do the standard uh, ingots display and I know I've got uh, the uh, uh, ore detector thing kind of in the way there um, if you do the standard uh, ingots display it actually shows you the ores uh, in this as well uh, so you see on the side everything is zero ore uh, and the reason it's zero ore is because I, I actually have um, these other two. So there's a container under this uh, elbow, the curved uh, conveyor. Uh, and then this is the other container. So container and container. Uh, this container is set up as the cargo transmit container uh, in conjunction with this guy. These two are, are actually the uh, Kenti Mega Mini refineries uh, here. So these guys um, are, are actually pulling from uh, anything because they're all in a line here. They're all, uh, they're not directly connected, but they're connected. So they act as kind of a conveyor system and uh, ultimately they will suck uh, whatever materials out as they need and then go in. So uh, basically as I was mining, it was pulling in the ore, it was refining the ore and then dumping it back into the containers as the ore uh, or as the as the inventory space filled up in these guys. So uh, with two of them there, it was, it was absolutely keeping up with all what the drills could do. So uh, it, was, it was definitely not an issue. These, these guys are really fast, uh, hence their Mega Mini uh, entitled. So um, what I did here was three large reactors. These reactors are Kenti reactors, so they are running 100 gigawatts each. Uh, so they are about, uh, let me see, 300 megawatts uh, are, are the, if I remember right, yeah, I think it's 300 megawatts uh, out of the large reactors, the vanilla large reactors. So these are uh, quite a bit bigger, almost an order of magnitude bigger. Um, so, and that was intentional. Um, I, I got tired of building huge ships and needing half the space. It was kind of the same with gyros. Um, uh, for example, this, this is four Kenti gyros on here. And uh, they are, the gyros, the Kenti gyros are 100 times. By, by the math, they're 100 times more powerful, uh, which is to say I took the force, uh, which if you get into the configuration files, uh, you find a, a force uh, number and what I did was took that number and added two zeros on the end of it is, is what I did so I multiplied it by a hundred and put that into these guys so these guys are actually a hundred times more powerful which is really to say these have the equivalent of a hundred times the gyro force uh, available to them that the other ones have and I, I discovered you know one turn of the mouse and this thing flips around um, like a gimbal. Uh, so I had to turn these down to 1%. So they're basically, I could have put four vanilla gyros on here and it would have been just fine. <laughs> so, uh, Kenji gyros. Um, but the gyros, the power, the storage, all of that came about from, you know, I would build these, these great big huge monstrosity ships that I don't think you can even build anymore. And uh, I half the ship is reactors, and the other half of the ship is uh, gyros, just to uh, make it move. Uh, and and the the other half, yeah, three halves, uh, is thrusters. 
Um, you know, it used to be you could stack thrusters end to end to end, and uh, when they actually started damaging, when they introduced uh, damage, thruster damage, then, you, whoops, you couldn't do that anymore. And thankfully, they eventually put back in a uh, turn off thruster damage, and then you could stack your thrusters again. But um, So that was kind of interesting, because you could build some really, really cool ships and then stack your ion thrusters inside, and you couldn't even see the thrusters, but they were there. So the external thrusters then were uh, application of force, absolutely, but they were more aesthetic uh, on the outside. You didn't have to have just a bazillion thrusters uh, outside. So anyway. Um, so uh, 300 gig um, of, of power available here because I had no idea uh, how much I was actually going to need. Now with all of the beam drills going, uh, it looks like I'm using uh, about 3.6 to 3.8 gigawatts. Okay, so um, I would say uh, if you have five of the beam drills, they're going to use about 1.2 to 1.3 gigawatts. In fact, plan on 1.3 gigawatts. Um, so if we translate that down into singular, uh, so let's let's round up 1.3 to 1.5. So 1.515 divided by five is 300 megawatts each. So each beam drill using 250 to 300 megawatts each, which means for every beam drill you put down, you're going to have to have. Um, three vanilla large reactors just to power the beam drill. Okay, so uh, again, keep in mind how much power these things are actually taking. Um, so lots and lots and lots. So uh, anyway, proof of concept, uh, I built out of hydrogen. Uh, no particular reason to do hydrogen, just did hydrogen because I prefer hydrogen over everything else because hydrogen is I can do it on planets, I can do it on uh, space, it, it doesn't matter, in space, on planets, get my prepositions correct. Um, so I built in hydrogen. Uh, what do I need for hydrogen? Well obviously I have to have a gas generator and I have to have uh, tanks. So in this case I put four hydrogen tanks down, I put one oxygen tank which is over here which is for the, uh, uh, the cockpit. So obviously you need you need some stuff. So uh, again, this was a mock-up. Um, I could have done it with one, but I'm always into that redundant thing. Um, so two is better than one, right? So I put one on port, one on starboard, and then uh, even if I take a hit on the starboard side, then I should still be able to uh, to limp along with uh, with what I have. So um, power. Uh, obviously, we got the three reactors there in the center. Uh, the whole base of this thing is, of course, the beam drills. Uh, I have some batteries on the outside. Uh, I think that ended up with uh, seven batteries on each side, so 14 batteries total, because I took two of them out to put in the thrusters. So we have four up thrusters, we have four down thrusters, and I know up and down relative to space, right? Uh, six forward, six aft three port, three starboard. So this was, again, just a mock-up for the sake of mock-up. Uh, it is four gyros, uh, and then I put on uh, M Masters uh, automatic LCDs too, because I wanted to see uh, the material that I was taking in. Uh, so that's that enabled me to do that without actually going into uh, the containers and looking for myself. Um, so, uh, proof of concept, uh, absolutely valid, uh, which is to say proof of concept proven, uh, it, it does work. So, uh, having said that, um, I don't know if I saved this, uh, yes, I did. Um, so this is uh, mock-up, so I, I'm going to do an X, uh, control X, uh, I do have Space Master turned on at the moment. Uh, so this is the beam drill mock-up here. I'm going to go ahead and replace uh, with the clipboard just just in case there were some uh, changes from when I saved that last. Um, and then uh, I think yeah. Um, then we started this this new 
machine, which is going to be a little more space worthy, uh, no less ugly duckling looking. Um, and I started this last night. I was going to do this entirely on screen, and then it was like, oh, oh, I, I got to stop. So uh, not only did I stop, but uh, uh, I was, it was, I, I don't want to say it's half built, but it, it's got a lot of, of building here. Um, so what do we have? We have the same 15 beam drills. Uh, I did turretize them, and what I wanted to do is create a, a more of a vessel-like uh, machine here. Now, this is Kenti blocks in the middle, uh, so it's Kenti batteries. Uh, I'm using Prosimian's uh, armored conveyors in the middle here. Uh, and then, uh, so we have a Kenti sorter here. Why do I have a sorter when there's one built into the game? Because the sorters in the game are a thousand liter uh, inventory. So if you are moving a boatload of, of ore around, um, you're, you're gonna be really hurting um, at, at a thousand liters. Go. So if you think uh, a drill, uh, especially the beam drill here, is going to take in anywhere from four to five thousand uh, units uh, per second, which is either three to four or five times what the vanilla sorters can handle in a second, uh, then quickly you're going to overwhelm this, this sorter. Um, now, I'm running times three inventory, so this is actually three thousand, so it's not quite that bad, but uh, the Kenti sorters are like 300,000. Um, so they're much more capable uh, of doing the sorting. Uh, so that's why I created them. I don't, I, I, I don't want to turn this into another rant uh, because it sounds like I just rant about everything, which actually is kind of true. Um, I understand that sorting takes some effort. I mean, if we if we apply reality, having a box, a magic box that does sorting, uh, isn't just uh, going to happen at real time. I understand that. Um, but when you have a conveyor system that's ultimately infinite, okay, there are no limitations uh, in your large grid conveyor system. You, you can drag, if you have, for example, if you break the game uh, on a single stack of material, and this is very, very hard to do, obviously, because the vanilla, uh, uh, vanilla containers can't really break the stack. Uh, but in the, in, the, uh, in the Kenti containers that are at the limit of the game, which is to say the, the value of leaders at the limit of the game, then you absolutely can break uh, the game when it comes to stacks. Um, so the stacks roll over and actually turn into this great big gigantic negative number, um, which then you can't move around anymore. So you, you totally break the stack. So if I go just below that, that stack breaking thing, you can literally drag it from one container to another through the conveyor system instantly. The whole stack. Okay, so the, your, uh, the ability to move materials through the conveyor system is effectively infinite. Uh, so having a sorter which is incredibly finite by comparison to me was a little silly. So I fixed that. Uh, or I fixed that according to my own whims. So anyway, that, that's why I did that. Okay, so we have a sorter here. What does this sorter do? Straightforward sorter. It pulls everything in from the drills. So the drills in this case are the three on the sides, uh, oh, sorry, the, the five on the sides. There are three uh, technically independent arrays of the drills. Okay, they're connected end to end, obviously. Uh, and then on the side here, I actually put uh, crosses and thrusters. Um, so these are my, uh, my up uh, and then the port and the starboard thrust. So really all I need is the down thrust and the forward aft thrust, uh, which, we'll, which we'll eventually we'll put in. Um, so all of these guys are really interconnected. So all these three arrays of drills are, are interconnected. The only uh, screw up on my part is that I mounted the turrets 
up instead of down. Uh, and the reason I did that was I pasted one and it was like, oh, well, that's up. Uh, okay. Um, so you can't really differentiate at least as, as far as, so the turret itself, the, b the big ball here, you can't tell uh, which way it's facing. Uh, so when you actually paste the, uh, the turret onto the drill, uh, you can see the side to side. Um, so you have these, uh, these sides of the gimbal here, uh, but you don't have any other aspect of this. So basically, um, whether you have it swilled up or down, you, you really do not know until you paste it, and then you can decide. And uh, unfortunately, they tend to auto-rotate. Uh, so even if you paste it, uh, and, and the reason I ended up with all five of them was because I, I did the... Uh, the planer thing, the planer pasting. Um, so it basically, I clicked on one and then, you know, moved, and then uh, pasted all five simultaneously. It's like, oh, well, those are facing up. Uh, so, oops. Uh, so what do I have here? So we have uh, four Kenti small reactors, and the reason I went with small reactors is because, well, the big reactors take up a whole lot of space. The other side of that is that the big reactors actually uh, are interconnected uh, because of it, it didn't matter because I've got a port underneath this conveyor uh, and the two sides. So it didn't actually matter which orientation I pasted the reactor in. It's going to be connected one way or the other. So I decided against that. And then when I actually did, uh, I looked at um, the, uh, the beam drill when it was functioning and saw that it was uh, 3.8 uh, gigawatts, then it was like, okay, well, I don't really need 300 gigawatt reactors. That, that's, you know... There's overkill, and there's like, oh my god. And uh, so I decided these these reactors, they're also Kenti reactors, but they're 5 gigawatts versus the 100 gigawatts. So they're almost the same proportion as the vanilla reactors, uh, 15 megawatts versus uh, 300 megawatts. Uh, so they're kind of the same proportionality, but almost an order of magnitude greater. Uh, so... Uh, in this case, 5 gigawatts was plenty enough for the 15 drills. So even though there's four of them here at 5 gigawatts, so I'm way overkill, uh, I still have plenty of reactor power, which is what was, what was intended. And because these are one block uh, reactors, then I can easily connect them onto the independent grid. So this sorter in this case pulls all the materials out of the drills and brings it into this container here, uh, which is the main storage container. Then there is the uh, Mega Mini refinery here. Then the uh, cargo transmit container here. And then the actual uh, cargo transmitter, cargo teleporter. Um, uh, port and starboard uh, gases generators. So uh, just had to have those. And I have one oxygen tank because obviously this is a man craft, uh, and then three hydrogen tanks in this case. And these are Kenti overpowered hydrogen tanks. So even though they say oxygen, nope, not really. Uh, they're actually uh, hydrogen tanks. Uh, and these guys, I think, are. I it, knowing me, uh, my overpowered is ten times. So this uh, ten times the uh, three by three by three uh, hydrogen tank storage. Um, pressurized gases, and the, I'm, I know I'm getting off onto a uh, tangent here, but pressurized gases, um, volume of the vessel is actually irrelevant. Um, because ultimately, uh, pressure uh, becomes the function. Uh, so as I increase the volume inside the tank, my pressure will increase appropriately, uh, proportionally. 
so the only exception to that is when you actually liquefy the gas. You, you have changed it from a gaseous state into a liquid state, uh, at which time you have an uncompressible mass. Uh, so then you are uh, wholly and completely limited by the size of the vessel. Um, so my thoughts were if I super compress the hydrogen, then I can uh, increase the volume and decrease the size. So my thoughts here are uh, these are these are hyper compressed and so uh, we'll feed out hydrogen appropriately. Uh, again, it was more of a space concern thing. All right, so uh, two uh, gas generators here, Kenti gas generators. We have a single oxygen tank, which is right here, and uh, three hydrogen tanks, and then my four reactors. So all of those right now, the reactors are not powered, so I'm, I'm running entirely off the batteries. Now, I put a, uh, a set of conveyors all the way down the center. So the, the, the two sides are connected via the crosses, on the on the corners which also have the um, the thrusters and uh, we have this was a this was a test as well so all of my gas storage is on this side so this single uh, conveyor system coming up and through it comes up right here elbows into this guy right this is a sorter sorters normally one way Okay, but gases, as, as I'm going to prove to you in a moment, gases can actually go backwards through a sorter. As long as it's connected, they can go backwards through the sorter. And let me prove that to you. So one of the things you notice is all the hydrogen thrusters are powered. They're all lit. The only way a hydrogen thruster can be lit is if it has a source of hydrogen somewhere, right? So uh, these guys are lit. They're interconnected with the drills. Uh, so these are actually feeding via the drill conveyor, which the only connection into the gases is via this sorter right here. Okay. So the sorter is actually allowing them to feed the gases backwards. So this is this is good news. Uh, so. Um, we have basically two independent grids here, uh, or, or conveyor systems. So this one up here that is only connected via this right here. So if you notice the gas uh, generators here, yes, they have the side ports, but the side ports actually do not line up with the ports on the drills, so they're not connected. And they're actually connected across via this uh, container here. Uh, so these guys are, are connected via this guy um, but only only interconnection point uh, back into the drills themselves is this here so this was designed to pull all that material out of the drills constantly dump it into this box but at the same time com completely isolates my reactors and uh, gas generators from the drills themselves so I can keep pulling everything out and not have it pull stuff from here. So that way I have everything here. The only thing uh, that I can't prevent is this guy from pulling uh, ingots and ice um, out of these containers without actually setting the blacklist, which, which I'm probably not going to do uh, on this particular model. So the idea here uh, actually, let me finish this statement. So the only thing down here on the bottom is this this one singular conveyor system that is not interconnected, okay? Uh, which is to say it's not interconnected along here. It's a single conveyor that connects all the drills, and then the drills are independently connected. The drill arrays are independently connected on the outside. So all the drill arrays come together. And uh, we have this singular line uh, of conveyors here which come up right here. So this is the only connection point uh, is right here. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and uh, I'll nuke this uh, just so you can see it. So this is a singular connection point here uh, that comes up uh, 
and ultimately connects on to this sorter here. And, and that was entirely uh, intended. That, that was what it was supposed to do. I wanted a singular connection point so I could use the sorter to pull in all that material constantly. Uh, so basically the drills will not store anything. The storage will always be uh, in this first container there. So let me put that back in. Oh darn, I colored it the wrong color because I just started the game. So there we go. Alright, so that's that was my singular connection point in. Uh, and then around the outside I pasted uh, batteries all the way across. So we have our entire bank of batteries. Um, these are Kenti batteries, so they're uh, a, just a, about three and a quarter, three and a third, well three and a third, uh, hotter than. So, well not, not actually, not three. Um, so the normal battery is four megawatt hours. Uh, Kenti batteries are 10 megawatt hours uh, per battery, so that was that's the differential there. Um, and and why did I do that? I, I love batteries, but you know battery technology being what it is, there's there's a lot of incredible uh, technology advancements in batteries even in the last decade. Uh, so even if you look at, I, I know I'm off on another tangent, another science tangent here, but even if you consider, let's take the the three types of small scale. Uh, we're, we're talking small scale because obviously lead acid batteries have been around for uh, actually more than a century now. Um, so lead acid batteries actually were invented uh, in the late 19th century. Um, there's, there's some uh, argument as to exactly when and by whom. Uh, and in fact, if you get into ancient history, uh, there is some argument and conjecture, which I think is uh, reasonably well-founded in fact, that the ancient Egyptians actually had a form of battery uh, and a form of light. Uh, there are some pictographs, uh, pictographs, sorry, let me pronounce that correctly, uh, that, that give that appearance. So even though we don't have literature in the same way, uh, actual written documentation in the same way that we have today, on what the ancient Egyptians had, there is some conjecture, and I think well-founded conjecture, that they may have had batteries and lighting. So, uh, having said that, um, batteries have been around for a long time. So lead-acid batteries from the late 19th century, 1870, 1880s, is, is the presumption. Um, and then we move forward into the uh, 40s and 50s, where we actually had... Uh, nickel cadmium uh, and nickel cadmiums are a very unique rechargeable battery um, and of course all of the modern batteries are a chemical process um, so whether we use uh, you know lead sulfate and lead uh, to create this uh, electricity uh, by way of an electrolyte or we use other materials uh, it's all basically a chemical process. We are, we are making electrons move by way of chemical process. So all the batteries follow that same basic philosophy. Um, so we go from nickel cadmiums um, to uh, nickel metal hydrides, uh, which actually produce a bit more power, a bit more stably, and, and don't have the same uh, memory issue that we had with uh, with nickel cadmiums, NICADs, uh, if you're if you're old enough to remember what those were, um, and then uh, new and modern are the lithium batteries, which actually are much lighter, still a chemical battery, uh, but much lighter and actually produce uh, about the same uh, output, electron output. So. Uh, Lithium batteries are actually becoming much, much more popular and much more readily available. Uh, the advantage to lithiums, uh, the advantage to the nickel metal hydrides uh, are they have a 100% duty cycle, as did nickel cadmiums. Lead acid batteries do not have a 100% duty cycle. Um, in, in fact, if you go beyond about 50% of the battery for a lead acid battery, and I know this is space engineers <laughs> and I'm talking about batteries, but uh, 
if you go below about 50% of the capacity, the actual rate of capacity of a lead acid battery, you will permanently damage the battery. So uh, why is that important? It's because the most readily available and, and in fact cheap per size battery that you can find out there is still a lead acid battery. So many solar systems, actually, if you have a DC solar system, um, actually use lead acid batteries as the storage mechanism. And where that comes into play is you really have to calculate the wattages and the, the usage uh, according to those batteries. So you may have, you know, a 20 or 30 kilowatt uh, solar grid, but if you're going to draw 30 uh, kilowatts from your batteries, uh, I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward that I've got a 30 kilowatt solar array, therefore I have a 30 kilowatt inverter array. That, that makes perfect sense. But what do you do for the batteries that are not rated in watts, but rated in amp hours? So you have to translate watts backwards into amps and then amp hours and figure out how much battery storage do you have. On the other side of that equation is how much storage do you have? Because obviously if I just have 30 kilowatts of, of storage, that's really not quite so solar. And of course now I've gone from batteries to solar. Wow. Um, bottom line is you have to calculate everything in terms of the here and now. The, the inverter is inverting 30 kilowatts right now per second. Uh, the solar array hopefully is generating the same amount, which means it's a wash. But, uh, so this is instantaneous time, right? Whereas our batteries are measured in watt hours, amp hours. Um, so all of a sudden we have this need to apply a timeline to these things, um, so your capacity therefore becomes a function of the size of the battery and again you never want that battery to drop below 50 percent of usable uh, because you will permanently destroy it uh, you'll permanently degrade uh, its ability to store energy uh, and again this is a chemical process uh, those plates are going back and forth from lead sulfate depending on what is actually in the batteries usually it's sulfuric acid so we go from lead to lead sulfate back to lead uh, in, in the process, uh, an electrochemical process. And the problem is when we completely sulfate those lead plates, they never come back to 100%. Uh, and in fact, the reason why you only get X number of years out of the batteries is because for every cycle, the charge and, and discharge cycle, less and less can come back to that original uh, lead material. So eventually we get to the point where the batteries are so sulfated they no longer actually do that chemical process back and forth anymore. Um, the problem is when you go below that 50% mark, uh, you, you nev there, there's a, a severe degradation at that point and you never actually come back. So you can, can severely uh, degrade the battery life by having dropped below that 50% line. Um, so back to the batteries. Um, nickel cadmiums uh, did not have that problem. You did have a 100% duty cycle from all the way charged 100% down to zero. Okay, the problem with nickel cadmiums was at the bottom like 10%, they started dropping in voltage as well. So you, you had this, this uh, uh, drop off at the bottom which ended up being kind of non-usable uh, because the voltage dropped off. Uh, nickel metal hydrides uh, did not have nearly that curve. It was like the last 2% of battery life and it dropped off sharply. Uh, lithiums uh, actually don't really have the voltage drop off. Uh, they do, but it, it's very, very minor. They run out of that ability to produce the energy and they drop off. Boom, done. Uh, so it's like the last uh, half a percent or something like that. 
So yes, it does drop voltage. If you really put it on a graph and, and did it over time, you will see the voltage drop. But it, it happens so quickly that reasonably you can determine, oops, I'm at the end of the battery life, Doop, done. Uh, so, you know, that, that very, very sharp drop off. So, my view is that battery technologies being what they are, and this is today, uh, 2018, we have these rather grand technologies. Um, how much battery could we really have? Well, it really depends on the technology, but some of the lithium ion batteries, and, and here's where I'm going with this. This is a single block, one by one by one block, right? Okay, if we translate this into actual size, that's two and a half meters by two and a half meters by two and a half meters. That's a damn big block. Okay, if we apply that to reality, okay, that's taller than most people uh, in, in all three directions. So that's a huge space, two and a half meters. That's a huge block in reality. So how many batteries can I store in that? Um, that's a lot of battery power. So this is why I changed from uh, the, you know, four megawatts uh, to the 10, because I think that's more realistic. Now, you, know, you can calculate numbers. I, I did the calculations based on nickel metal hydrides, which aren't nearly as efficient as the lithium batteries. So I suppose if I, if I really did the calculations there size-wise, um, especially with the technologies that are constantly increasing, um, I, I might actually reevaluate and discover, well, you know, 10 megawatt hours is really not actually enough. So, anyway. so uh, the, the goal here, even though I have now crossed over into the zone of beyond an hour, um, I really just wanted to show you what I had done uh, from the prototype here. And let me go ahead and, um, oh, I'm, I'm not moving like I want to move. Um, the, uh, the prototype, uh, this guy. Versus the much more intended version of this one. Now, what I have not considered is do we stick with 15 drills or being as we have the power to be able to do more, do we stack another one of these guys on the back? And, and I haven't really decided uh, if, if that's a practical thing or not. I don't know. Maybe uh, it would look really, really silly floating through space, but probably no less silly or more silly than this. One. So when we make this actually mobile, uh, it's going to look a little bit silly just because of what it does. But obviously having, uh, in this case, 30 drills uh, mining away at an asteroid, uh, it might make very short work of the asteroid uh, versus, you know, the 15 drills that this one has. So the idea here was that I should be able to, and, and what I have not entirely discovered is uh, do I actually have the room? Uh, are these um, are these thrusters going to get in the way? And, and actually I think they are going to get in the way. Uh, so uh, with them in the way, uh, is that going to cause huge problems uh, with the rotational because you see these are um, I, I can't tilt down this way so there there may be some issues when it comes to uh, these guys uh, is a flat plane idea like this one a better idea to give me full 180 degree coverage uh, so semi hemispherical coverage uh, of each drill and it, it may be um, so this one may not be functional uh, as far as the practicality goes so might be some issues here and uh, this is where the experimentation comes in uh, so what I figured I'd do is build this uh, test it out see what it can do but in observing how this one was functioning 
Uh, I think I'm going to have orbital issues with this one, orbital issues with this one, uh, which is to say these guys not being able to swivel around uh, at nearly uh, the same uh, capability uh, that, that this one can, uh, which means I really need to, um, if I develop a beam drill machine like this one, this one actually I think uh, for just total asteroid clearing is going to be much more practical and, and in fact much more useful than this one is. So definitely, definitely some issues there. So we'll, we'll play with that. All right. Uh, having said that, I've crossed over my hour line, my hour marker. So this is Kenji Tiger signing off. Thank you for watching and we'll catch you next time.